Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, one in a series of virtual sessions the Center on Global Energy Policy is hosting as part of the seventh annual Columbia Global Energy Summit. My name is Laurie Fitzmaurice, and I am the Executive Director at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia SIPA. Today, we're going to discuss the promise and challenge in Latin America's energy future. Let me quickly say that this event is being webcast live, and the full video will be available online in the coming days. For those of you joining us via Zoom, you can submit a question for the panelists at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I'd like to take just a moment to describe the bios of our three panelists. Minister Juan Carlos Chobet, who holds the position of Minister of Energy and Mining in Chile, has held various other positions in public service in that country. He has been Minister of Labor and Social Welfare, Under Secretary of Housing, and Cabinet Chief for the Minister of the Interior in the first administration of President Sebastián Piñera. He is currently, as I mentioned, the Minister of Energy and Mining in that country. Prior to his activities in government, he held various roles in the private sector. We're fortunate to have him here with us today. Dr. Mauricio Cárdenas is, a, is currently a visiting senior research scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy, where he leads research focused on energy and climate policy in Latin America. He's also a visiting professor at Columbia University, SIPA. Dr. Cardenas is a recognized expert on Latin America and an economist with a vast academic um, experience, with vast academic experience and policymaking experience. He's also a former finance minister from Colombia between 2012 and 2018. We are again very fortunate to have him here with us today. Luis Alberto Moreno is the former president of the Inter-American Development Bank. He served from October 2005 to October 2020. Prior to joining the IDB. He served as Colombia's ambassador to the United States for seven years. Again, it's wonderful to have you with us, Luis Alberto. I'd like to just take a moment to get started and thank our speakers for joining us. We have a number of interesting things to talk about today. We're going to start by giving our speakers the opportunity to give us three to five minutes of comments on our general topic. Then we'll move to a panelist discussion and then we'll take question and answers from all of you. So please take a moment to, to get started thinking about those questions. I'm gonna tee up our conversation by framing our discussion, but just putting a question out to our speakers and then ask each of them to comment, as I said. So to get started, I'd like to ask all of you to comment on the ways in which the countries in Latin America can the countries in Latin America will be position themselves to participate in the global energy transition. So if you can think about that for a moment and just give us three to five minutes of your thoughts, I would greatly appreciate it. Senor Ministro, would you like to begin? Great, thank you, Lori. Uh, hello, everyone. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for this for this opportunity. Hello, Mauricio and Luis Alberto, and hello everyone who's watching. I hope you're all healthy and doing and doing well. So, I think this this energy transition for our region it's it's, it's going to be challenging, but it's it's an enormous opportunity as well. I'm I'm very optimistic about it. Uh, I, I understand that the realities of different countries are different. We have some countries that are big producers of, of oil and gas, for example. That's not our case. But in, in the case of Chile, maybe to start there uh, briefly, um, we have historically depended on fossil, imported fossil fuels as our main source of, of energy, right? Over 70% of our energy comes in the form of imported oil, coal, and natural gas. But we have an enormous renewable energy potential. We have probably the best solar irradiance in the planet in the north, in the Atacama Desert, where, where capacity factors can be over 37%. And we have very strong and persistent winds in many regions of our country, especially in the south in Patagonia, where capacity factors can be over around 70%, which is, uh, uh, and that's not offshore, right? It's in inland, right? So it's, and, and that is not only very good resources, but very abundant. We, we estimate that we, we, we could be able to install around 70 times renewable capacity, generation capacity, uh, 70 times what we have today, right? So we need to find ways not only to use that electricity uh, in our country, but also to find ways to export that 
electricity in different forms, probably through hydrogen or its derivatives to the world, right? And we are moving very quickly. We are closing our coal plants. Uh, we have challenges there. We can come back to that in a second because there are jobs there. We, we need to work on adjust transitions for, for those communities. But we're facing out coal, developing renewable capacity very quickly. We, just to give you a sense, this year we will build uh, six gigawatts of projects in, in, in sol, uh, solar and wind, and that will double our solar and wind capacity in just one year. Right? Uh, we think we're going to have over 70 or 75 renewable capacity by 2030 and around 100% renewable by 2050. And that clean electricity will open many opportunities in other sectors of the economy. We will use electricity in transportation to replace oil and its derivatives. We're increasingly using electricity for heating at home, especially in the south of the country where most people use firewood that generates pollution and health problems. And we are using that electricity in different industries, including mining, which is our biggest uh, industry. So it's opening a lot of opportunities, the energy sector and mining as well. But energy, it's, it's kind of pulling uh, the economic recovery, right? So it's important to understand that it's not, some people think that taking care of the environment is kind of hurting the economy. And we th I think that if we do things well, the both both uh, goals go hand in hand. We can have a very strong economic recovery based on a lot of investment in, in, in clean energy that will create jobs and help the economy recover from the crisis triggered by the pandemic. So I'm very optimistic. We have challenges that we can come back later in the Q&A, but I'm very optimistic. And I think that if we do things in, in, a, in a good way, it's, it's going to be uh, very good for our, for our region. I think I think you're you're muted. Laurie, yeah. Well, thank you, Laurie. Well, I'm delighted to be in this panel with two good friends, uh, Minister Jove, whom I admire very much. What he is doing, it's a good example for many to follow in Latin America, and my very very good friend, uh, Luis Alberto Moreno. We've done a lot of things together. I'm delighted that we're again meeting at the center, uh, where he's serving in the advisory board. So delighted to be here. Let me say, let me, let me bring into the conversation a few facts just to highlight how important is this conversation for Latin America. Latin America has 8.4% to be exact of the world's population. And it contributes with 8.3% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. So we're pretty average in that sense. Where we're misaligned with the rest of the world is in two fronts that we need to bring into this debate. One is the pandemic. We cannot abstract ourselves from what's going on today in the region. Uh, the region has 30% and counting of the global fatalities associated with COVID-19. That has caused a tremendous social and economic crisis. The region last year contracted 7.4%. It was the region of the world with the sharpest GDP contraction. And something that is, I guess, even more worrisome is that this year's recovery, it's gonna be relatively modest. I think except for Chile, this is the IMF's projections, uh, growth this year will not offset the contraction of last year. So at the end of 2021, we will be still below the level of income that we had a year ago. Another area in which the region is completely misaligned with the rest of the world, it's in terms of the effects of climate change, what we could call the climate crisis, the number of extreme weather events. By one source, 19 of the 25 countries that are mostly impacted by climate change are in Latin America, 19 of the 25, and a big share of that in Central America and the Caribbean. Just Keep in mind that extreme weather events are occurring much more frequently and are becoming more costly. On average, a Latin, America, a Latin American country that faces an extreme weather event loses 0.9% of its GDP. And that is happening almost every other year for the average country. Good recent examples are Nicaragua and Honduras that lost 6% in the case of Nicaragua due to the hurricanes 
IOTA and ETA last year, just two weeks apart. So the effects of the climate crisis are evident and are evident for the population in Latin America. This is the reason why Latin America has taken the energy transition very seriously, uh, because we're seeing the effects and we're seeing the consequences of climate change. So energy transition is moving forward uh, at a faster speed in some countries than others. But for the big majority of the countries in the region, uh, the challenges in terms of compliance with the national determined contributions are huge. The countries have increased the level of ambition. Um, for example, my own country uh, that initially had announced a 30% reduction in emissions by 2030, it's now at 55%, that's the target. So we need, we have the ambition, we have the goals, we have the targets, we need the strategies. And I think that's what we need to add into this conversation, how to make sure that that energy transition is successful. We have some good examples, which is the topic of a recent book I wrote with two colleagues from the Inter-American Development Bank, and they're the auspices of Luis Alberto Moreno when he was president, uh, Juan Pablo Nilla and Federico Brusa. We have an illustration of the things that are happening in the right direction, like the electrification of public transportation in Santiago de Chile, in Bogota, or the transition to um, renewable energy in Chile, in Uruguay, in Brazil, in Colombia. We have good examples, but we still have a lot of work to do because we need to make sure that to get out of this crisis, the crisis that has resulted from COVID-19, we use the energy transition to generate growth, to generate jobs, and also to, to work in a direction that I think is gonna be important. And we need to discuss this in this panel, which is um, more uh, respect um, and support for the political institutions in the region, which are being challenged because uh, they're not delivering to the middle classes. But we can talk about that later. Yeah, I think that's a, a very important point we should come back to, that end and cost. Um, Luis Alberto, would you like to comment? Well, thank you. And, and I, I think both the, what Mauricio uh, mentioned and Juan Carlos is a very good way to start. And let me, first of all, thank you. And it's great to be with both uh, uh, you, Laurie, and of course with, with Juan Carlos and, and, and Mauricio. You know, one of the things that it's important to take into consideration going from the macro of, you know, what all these uh, effects of governments, starting with uh, President Biden's push on, on the recent uh, uh, climate change summit that he held, is the implications that this is going to have in energy throughout the world. The, the, we're almost going to have what we saw in Latin America with technology, a profound jump from analog to digital. And I mean here, what's gonna happen on renewable energy. We already had, as Mauricio correctly placed, a, you know, a pretty clean energy matrix. But what's interesting is, as uh, Juan Carlos was mentioning, the cost of renewable energy in Latin America and the way that it's being implemented is extremely low. You take a country like Brazil, for instance, when you come to wind, which actually, by the way, it's equally true in the Patagonia and it's equally true in the south of Chile, tremendous uh, possibilities with, with energy, equally with solar. I mean, just on photovoltaic alone, Brazil grew something like 220% last year alone. So what we're seeing is already countries making this huge push on the energy transition. The biggest challenge, of course, it, it's going to be more and more on the regulatory areas. It's going to be on distributed energy. It's uh, on areas of energy efficiency. We've done a lot when it comes to public buildings. We have done less when it comes uh, to what can be done in the private sector. Uh, the areas of electromobility that were touched upon briefly. But here, I think we have an enormous challenge. Uh, most of our infrastructure, Mauricio knows this well by having his days as Minister of uh, Transportation uh, and Infrastructure in Colombia, the reality is that most of the road systems, not only in Colombia, but most countries around the world have been financed by uh, gasoline taxes. Uh, and, you know, we fast forward to the next 20 years, it, we're going to have a lot of electromobility. And electromobility in a way that the way that uh, electric cars are constructed are not unlike computers. So there's going to be a lot of possibilities from the regulatory perspective of the ways that we can manage traffic in the ways that we have to rethink fundamentally how our whole regulation system uh, operates. So these are areas where 
uh, we're going to have to be looking at. You know, we in Latin America, especially in South America, most of our energy comes uh, from hydro. And it's hard to, to see that more and more hydro projects are, are built for a variety of, of challenges, many of them are environmental in nature. Uh, but the reality is how can we do like in, 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 in the oil fields where you can re-rigor re, re uh, those oil fields to be more productive. I think this is another challenge that we're gonna have in ways of how to, to make better what we already have. And digitalization is another area that I would say are some of the, the challenges that we have going forward, but equally the, the opportunity. Um, and at the end, you know, and I'm sure that we'll have time to, to discuss this is, you know, there is this imbalance between uh, the developed world and the emerging world, especially when we have a case where we have largely not only an, a clean energy matrix, but fundamentally in the global commons that we have, the Amazon for one, being a great place to store uh, CO2 emissions. Um, we need to have a balance in this uh, to be able to, to have the kinds of blended finance that are fundamental uh, to, to do this energy transition. Uh, and when I mention uh, blended finance, uh, you take a country like Chile that, that uh, Juan Carlos was mentioning, if he wanted to accelerate the process of doing away with many of the uh, uh, fossil fuel types of plants, having a way to have lower costs of financing to accelerate this process of transition. I'm sure many businesses and governments be willing to do it, but where is that money gonna come from? And if we don't have those kinds of tools, I think it's going to be very difficult to close the kinds of gaps and the levels of ambitions that governments are working towards, as Mauricio was saying, every government is trying to push the dial on this, but there's gonna be these huge financing gaps that are gonna require some kind of blend. So I'll stop there. I know this is can come back to many of these points. Yeah, I think that actually this is a perfect segue into a question I wanted to ask um, to kick off more of a, a conversation approach to the next section of our discussion, which is echoed by some of the questions I'm saying that we'll get to when we get to Q&A uh, from the audience, which is really touches on a number of the things that the three of you have raised. Really, given the complex social and political realities that we're seeing in, in countries across the region, whether we look at Chile with the protests that started in late 2019, triggered by an increase in metro fares, so or we look at Ecuador and the social unrest in response to public sector salary and you know cuts in public sector salaries in May of 2020, or more recently in Colombia in response to proposed tax legislation. Um, can can you comment, any any one of you? about the, the likelihood that public coffers can be tapped to finance the energy transition. Really, where is this money gonna come from? And how can we relate the energy transition to issues of equity and equality and, and very compelling needs as we see the impact that Mauricio talked about with regard of the pandemic and economies that have been contracting in the last year in particular? Who would like to begin? Yeah, I can, I, can, I, can go, I can go first very briefly so we can have more of a conversation. I think one point I, I think it's important is I think the energy transition and, and reaching carbon neutrality, everybody agrees with that in an abstract level. But when you come down to the concrete things we need to do to get there, it gets more complicated. And let me give you one example, right? So everybody agrees we need to, call, to close our uh, coal fire plants and that we need to, to uh, replace them with renewable energy, right? But one thing that we need to do to, to do that is to, we need to build transmission lines to go and move the electricity from where the natural resources are to where consumption is, right? And there it gets more complicated, right? So people don't want coal, coal uh, fire plants, but they don't want usually transmission lines either, right? So. And there are many examples like that. Hydropower, as Luis Alberto was saying, we have an enormous hydropower potential, right? But the reality is it's very hard to build new hydro capacity. Uh, and we are generating around 35 to 40% of our electricity with coal, which is 
a contradiction, right? It makes no sense. But when you come down to the execution of these transitions, it's, it gets complicated. When you when you touch the interest of local communities or particular, uh, uh, I mean, business communities, uh, so I think politicians and governments have an enormous role to play. How do we sequence all the measures we're taking? How do we make sure that the transitions are smooth so we don't hurt, I mean, people's uh, ways of life? So, so it, I think it's in the abstract, it's easier when you <laughs> you get down to concrete measures it gets more complicated. Mauricio. Well, I think you're, you're right on target because we have to get better at resolving uh, tensions and in some cases, uh, even contradictions. I'm speaking to you today from Bogota where we have a national strike. It's been almost three weeks now of a lot of turbulence, instability. There is a negotiation going on between the different groups that are leading this national strike and the government. And there are 18 points on the table. And of those 18 points, there are four that are related to uh, climate. Uh, for example, a, a complete end to deforestation, the protection of uh, endangered species, um, a change in practices in the mining and oil sector that some read as a ban on fracking. Um, so, you know, there are a number of of climate issues there. For example, uh, one very interesting point on that, on that list is that public transportation should stop using inefficient uh, fossil fuels um, and should move into electrification of public transportation. So things that you, know, you shouldn't uh, really oppose to, I think are very aligned with this agenda. But what triggered this social unrest, a, a tax reform, and a tax reform that included many, many items, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but had an extension of the carbon tax that we had introduced in 2016, including now natural gas, and also a tax reform that intended to charge the VAT on gasoline prices. So that was a trigger. And then the movement is putting on the table some issues that are actually protection of, uh, of our environment. So there are contradictions there and we need to resolve them in, an, in a democracy and we need to resolve them uh, well. Um, carbon pricing is I think a very contentious issue because it's, it's relatively rare in Latin America. Only a handful of countries have carbon prices, Mexico, Chile, Colombia, Argentina in a very partial way. Uh, the big majority of countries in this region, what they have is energy subsidies, fossil fuel subsidies. Um, and dismantling that and reusing that has been um, a, a serious obstacle. It's been very, very difficult to deal with that issue. So I think we need to um, make sure that this vision, the idea of the reduction in emissions, uh, the idea of having a, you know, a cleaner air in our cities, compliance with uh, our commitments in the Paris Agreement are in line uh, with what we need to get there. Because otherwise, uh, I think at the end of the day, we're not going to be able to deliver what we had promised. Let, let me, uh, Lori, pick up on something that both yeah. Mauricio and, and Juan Carlos mentioned. Juan Carlos was talking about, uh, you know, the need also to look at the kinds of grids that we have today, mm -hmm. because the, the distributed energy is going to be one in which both with the low cost of both solar and wind, uh, increasingly you're gonna find uh, companies and even people in their own homes uh, putting uh, you know, solar panels, et cetera. The, the lower these costs uh, take place, especially in rural areas where it's very difficult to get there, you know, there should be the kinds of incentives for that uh, new type of grid to be uh, put in place uh, in the ways that, that uh, uh, Juan Carlos Juan mentioned. And on the other aspect, in terms of energy efficiency, like I was saying earlier, few things have been done. I mean, Mexico, for instance, is something very interesting. Uh, it was, I remember, under President Felipe Calderón, he said uh, he created a, a, an incentive for people to change their old air conditionings and their own uh, old uh, refrigerators. Uh, and, and, and the campaign was, cambie su viejo por uno nuevo. Viejo in old 
in, in Mexico can also be the husband. So change your husband for another. Uh, but uh, that, that was the message. And it was a very colorful kind of uh, campaign, but it, it created a huge effect. And, and just I uh, hear the point is when the government provided the kind of incentive that you could essentially change these hugely inefficient type of equipment inside homes where now you could have you know, a smarter monitoring of, of the uh, kind of energy consumption. These are the kinds of things to the household which are gonna be central where we're far behind. And especially, you know, you see this in the US and you see it in other countries. These are the kinds of things that we're gonna need to put in place, but they're gonna be costly. And, and in this environment, as Mauricio correctly described, uh, you know, the needs are so much bigger than the capacity of governments to deliver. And this is where we're going to have to, to find a way to, to close these gaps. Well, and you know, you're, you reminded me about that program. Actually, a very good friend of mine was heavily involved in rolling that program out um, in Mexico. And I think that the, the wit that was involved there, when you see these downstream solutions being rolled out, it requires um, careful crafting of messaging, obviously. And, and you bring up something interesting, I think, which is, to what extent, obviously the government needs to play a role, but you also need the private sector to play an important role. And, and in, in different countries, you have those downstream power companies, either some are in the hands of, of government entities and some are in the hands of private companies. And so I think we're gonna have to see uh, participation of, of the private sector, Mauricio. Yeah, I just wanted to add something in line with what uh, Minister Jovet said at the beginning, which is the energy transition can proceed in some areas without uh, strong subsidies or taxes. It just, it, it can happen by market forces. That's what we're seeing, for example, in the power sector because of the reduction in the costs of generation with solar, wind energy, uh, that is already very competitive vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, for example, the hydropower, which is quite abundant in the region, which is good news. And this is what the region is doing. The region is proceeding in, in that transformation. Um, but that needs transmission lines. Yes. We need to build transmission lines and transmission lines are facing obstacles because of opposition, opposition from indigenous communities, from um, uh, sectors in the areas where the transmission lines are built because they want to get some investment in, in those areas. In our case here in Colombia, we have a process of previous consultations with the communities, the local communities, that is taking a long time and it's delaying this project. So this, this is a serious issue. This is where the market works, but then there are other obstacles that can prevent the energy transition from moving forward. And let me say that we need to make progress in making sure that we have better integration in the region because all these new sources of energy are not equally distributed in all countries. There are some countries that are in a better position to generate with solar or wind energy and ideally they should be exporting energy to other countries that are less well endowed in that sense. So um, the issue of uh, energy integration also comes as a very strong point when we come, when we want to uh, accelerate the energy transition. Mm -hmm. Minister Jovet, I think you wanted to make a comment and then I'd, I'd like to add something here. Yeah, yeah. Two, two brief, brief points. First, uh, on what Mauricio was saying, I agree that there are many technologies that are already there and that are profitable that don't need subsidies. But what we are seeing in Chile is there are some technologies that are profitable, but still people need access to financing. So let, let me give you one example. If you replace firewood with electricity for heating, and you buy the equipment, like uh, the heat pump, how do you, do you call that? Yeah, and air conditioning for heating. Uh, if you do the numbers, it's profitable, right? The investment you put in, you save that with, or with your monthly bill, it's a good business. But many middle-class families don't have necessarily the thousand dollars or so that it required to make the investment, right? So it's, in some cases, it's subsidies, but in, in many cases, it's uh, financing as well, right? So how do we help those families access technologies that are profitable, but they don't have access to the money they need to, to get in? And the other thing we can, I think we can discuss is mining. And, and it's because I think this is a very important industry in Latin America as well, mining. We will not be able to stop climate change without mining. 
right? Without copper mining, without lithium, without, and I, th I think in mining, we see the same tensions we are seeing in the energy sector, right? So people want to stop climate change, that requires copper, but they don't want more copper mining. And that is, again, another tension or contradiction, which in an industry that is very important for Latin America as well, so. Mm -hmm. Since we're on that, on that topic, um, we're seeing a lot of questions about that in terms of opportunities for mineral development in the context of the energy transition. Um, I, I'd love to hear some comments from you, Minister Jobet, about that in terms of both financing opportunities to further develop that sector and what you're seeing there. Yeah, so so, so the, 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 the essence is it's simple, right? So renewable energy requires generation, like a solar or wind require, let's say four times more copper. In our case, copper is very important, four times more copper than a conventional generation facility, right? Uh, and electric vehicles require, again, like three or four times more copper than conventional vehicles, right? And since renewable electricity and electromobility are at the core of the solution to be, I mean, the path to be carbon neutral, the conclusion is very obvious. We will not be able to stop climate change unless we find or uh, come up with a substitute, substitute without copper mining, right? And the same is true for lithium for batteries, right? Uh, but we are seeing here uh, many groups opposing more investment in mining because uh, of its environmental impact, because of the impact it has in some local communities, uh, and also the political turmoil or the social unrest uh, is hurting the uh, long-term investments in mining. As you know, mining is in itself a very risky business, right? You have risk in exploration, price are volatile, you need to invest a lot of money and you need a lot, very long term horizon to recover that money. So I am seeing investors being a bit, a bit more cautious in this political environment. Uh, so, and I think it's very important to bring that investment in to, to help the, the economic recovery, right? So I think that is something we need to work on uh, because as I said, without mining, we won't be able to uh, make this energy transition successful. Can you comment also, we're seeing a lot of questions come through about the relationship um, with China as it relates to these minerals and, and renewables over the long term? Yeah, so, so China is it's, it's the biggest, in, in our case, China uh, buys around 50% of our copper and we produce around 30% of the, of the world's copper production. So China is very, very important for us, but we also, I mean, sell to uh, South Korea, to Germany, I mean, to other countries, right? Uh, so the economic recovery from China is uh, part of the explanation why pr uh, commodity prices are going up, especially copper, uh, but it's more than China, right? China is, is very important, it's more than China. I, I mean, the, the energy transition all over the world would, would require more, more minerals. Um, China has a very strong capacity in smelting and refineries, right? And that is another issue that some people are looking at with some, some concern. Um, but, I but I think China is, has shown recently a much stronger commitment to this agenda, to the climate agenda than they had shown in the past. So I think that's good news. So I think, I think uh, we are pretty much aligned. I, I don't look at China with, with uh, the concerns that some people uh, see there. I, we have had a very long, stable and, and fruitful relationship with them. Uh, and we have a very open economy. We, we have free trade agreements with almost 90% of the world's GDP. So China is very important for us, but we have many other trade partners as well. Thank you, thank you. If we think a little bit, I keep coming back to um, some of your comments, Luis Alberto, about the gap and the realities of a number of countries. Um, and I think Chile is a bit of an exception in this, but the, the financing and the challenges around the financing for the energy transition and, and where is the, 
the finance is going to come from. And while we may see the private, private sector play a role in certain contexts, I don't think it's as simple for many of the countries in the region. Um, so if we think about this broader reality, what role should developed countries potentially play in, in participating? And, and what role should the United States play, for example, in supporting the countries of Latin America in achieving the goals of decarbonization um, or the energy transition? So, Glory, this is, this is perhaps the most difficult question. And let me just draw a parallel. You know, the world wasn't ready for a pandemic. Climate change, as we all know, has been knocking on our door for some time. And as Mauricio was saying earlier, what have we seen? I mean, the reality is that the, the, the profound divide between countries that have access to the production of vaccines and how they have solved their own internal problems have been entirely different than what we see, for instance, today in Latin America, where, uh, you know, essentially the, the numbers, not only of cases, but of deaths are some of the highest in the world today of the top 10, close to six or seven countries are today in Latin America. And that's, that's a big question when we try to address something like, like uh, you know, this energy transition, climate change, which essentially, not unlike the, the COVID crisis, is a global problem. And as a global problem, the only way that I see possible, as Mauricio very eloquently explained, you know, this, this amazing situation that we're going to be in, in which we're on, not only going to have profound divisions within our countries, but amongst our countries, uh, there's going to be a need to have some kind of blended financing that can help us do this bridge, because this is all about bridging uh, that transition. And that can, not only, that can only happen with some kind of, you know, low cost financing, uh, grants, etc. Things like this have been tested, by the way, uh, you know, in multilateral development banks with some grant resources on low carbon agriculture, on, you know, energy transition. But this, of course, is all on the margin. You take, for instance, the the big discussion that took place uh, around the prior to the Paris Agreement. Uh, at the time, you know, there was this idea that the developed world would put $100 billion to help finance this. This was the origins of the Green Climate Fund. And then, and the final analysis it was basically multilateral institutions that were providing the bulk of that finance. And still that gap has not been closed. So this is a, a huge challenge. You can have all these ambition from the governments. It's not just the governments, as Mauricio and Juan Carlos have clearly pointed out. This is in, in Latin American society. People really want this. The question is, how can we deliver on that? And, and I only uh, see a way where we have that discussion between developed and emerging countries in ways uh, of transferring uh, those needs. And it can be done, perhaps, the, this big push by pension funds, by asset managers, where they really want to focus on this. You know, the, the notion that you have differentiated pricing, et cetera. These are the kinds of things that I, I think are going to have to happen. Not to mention the huge push of innovation and the effects of carbon taxes and what that can mean in our countries. And how can that innovation be shared throughout the emerging world as well? If uh, you know, as Juan Carlos was mentioning, I mean, in terms of storage of energy, I mean, lithium, uh, it's the, the bulk of the lithium of the world is concentrated in Chile, Bolivia, and Argentina, by far in, in terms of, of the world. And then you have the questions of mining, which are tensions, but clearly, uh, you know, mining is all about high tenor minerals and low costs of energy. And that's the only way that you can produce competitively. That's what countries like Chile have been able to do. And, and they're going, you know, this is what Latin America has been producing forever. I mean, we've always been exporters of, of commodities for, for a very long time. Mauricio, please. Gloria, there, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A that connect to this conversation. And I'd like to, to address them. Uh, our colleague at the center, Luisa Palacio, is asking, well, what's the connection of all this with an important player in the energy sector in Latin America, which are the 
national oil companies. And I think it's important to address that mm, because for many countries, including uh, my own country, these NOCs are an important source, not just of foreign exchange, GDP, but significantly uh, fiscal revenue. So what's going to happen? And I, I see that the world of NOCs in Latin America is divided into camps. One is the ones that are playing defensive, that are really trying to avoid a serious decline in oil production. A decline in oil production that is occurring for natural reasons, because of the uh, depletion of, uh, of the oil fields. That's the case of, um, of Mexico. Um, it's the case of Colombia. Colombia reached uh, a peak production of about a million barrels per day in 2013. It's now producing about 800,000. It's going to be very difficult to produce more than that. And if we don't do anything, it's going to go down very significantly in the next few years. So it's playing defensive, trying to keep production at the current level. The, the, the camp that is playing offensive is Brazil, the best known case, but also uh, uh, Guyana and Suriname are increasing their own production. And I think are the only countries that are likely to see increases in production in a significant way. So it is, it is a question about what's going to happen with these regions and, and with these countries, and especially with the public finances, uh, with the, the decline in, in oil production that is going to affect the public coffers. Um, that's where the conversation about fracking becomes important, at least in the case of Colombia, Argentina, uh, et cetera, which is highly contested and, uh, and a debated issue. Uh, many people opposing it. The, the, same, the same groups that are demanding more benefits from the state, that want more um, support from the government. So there's, this is another example of the contradiction that exists there. And there is a question by Oscar Valdez that is connected to this about carbon taxation. How likely is the region to adopt carbon taxes? So in today's political environment, with the social unrest that we're seeing in the streets of many cities in the region, I think is very unlikely. So we have to produce options. We have to suggest alternatives. And that's where I think um, that we could promote um, internal carbon prices. This is, this is a new concept. This is a concept about not really charging the carbon price or the carbon tax to people, uh, but to agree that the corporate world and of course the government have an internal carbon price when they decide about their investment projects. So um, it's, it's an agreement that uh, for large scale projects and especially for the government investment budget that the, the carbon price is factored in, even if it doesn't exist uh, for the general public. I think it's, an, it's, a, it's a step that we can take. It's an agreement that can be made between governments and big corporates uh, to, to actually make some progress in that direction. You may jump in. So what you were you saying, I think that's very interesting. So, so you're saying like a shadow price that companies and governments use in their own analysis to prioritize where investment goes, but, if, but it's not translated into prices for consumers. No. Now that, I think yeah, that it's, sounds... a, it's a second best, granted. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it doesn't do the same effect of a carbon tax, but it helps guiding some investment decisions. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. And, and I think the other thing is important thinking about COP26 this year, is uh, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, right? If we are able to set up an international market for, for carbon, right, for emissions, uh, we will be able, uh, because it's, it's harder, I think, to, to ask developed countries to basically subsidize the mm -hmm. developing countries. I mean, they are doing that and it's, and it's great and they should be doing more of that if they can. But it's easier if we funnel that money from the developed world to the developing world because that is a way uh, for the developed world to reduce their own emissions but making investments abroad where it's more efficient to reduce uh, emissions. Uh, and I think for, for our region that would be a very efficient way to, to get investment from abroad uh, that are not subsidies, right? Which raises, you know, we're, uh, we just got an interesting question in, in the chat um, from one of the, a member of the audience, which, which raises the issues about the pros and cons of investments in the developing world versus in, in developed countries and incentives around that and how to move investment capital 
into clean energy projects in, as part of the the transition, the energy transition. And this concept, I think, is really interesting, Mauricio. Again, as you say, it's a second best. Um, but I, I think it's that type of creativity that we need to look at because the the social realities, which are part of the political realities in Latin America, are going to require creativity to find solutions um, to these problems. And I think that will ultimately have to affect investment decisions. This one of the, the question is um, that there is some, basically this this individual, David Posen, is saying that there's substantial international investment capital available for investment in energy infrastructure and renewable energy projects, but the risk reward of investing in these projects must be competitive with opportunities available in the developed world. Absolutely agree, David. Um, and he's saying uncertainties such as those in Mexico around regulatory regime, which some of us know all too well, um, and the support for the oil sector have kept this investment away, absolutely. And he says, which countries in Latin America are going to be willing to put in place programs with long-term government offtake agreements to facilitate investment? An excellent question. Um, I think it, we also need to start looking at these types of creative ways of evaluating investments, because I think the older models of long-term offtake um, with you know, investment grade backing um, are not necessarily going to be available in the ways we historically thought about. I, I'd welcome comments from the panel. Or am I being too provocative? Maybe, maybe. I'm, not, I'm not sure I'll answer directly your question, but indirectly, yes. And since I see we're kind of like running out of time. Yeah. I think, I, I mean, we are based in the US. The center is based in the US. It, it really has a strong connection with the US policymakers. And we should bring into this conversation the role of the US. We talked about China. There was a question about China. We need to talk about the US. And I think there is the, the, there is no voice more influential in terms of hemispheric relationships than Luis Alberto's voice um, because of his experience as ambassador and especially because of his 15 years at the IDB. But, but it connects with your question because it's about how are we going to pay for this? How are we going to finance this? Um, I think the region is, is, is quite optimistic about the announcements of the Biden administration. I think President Biden made a bold statement in one of these uh, very heated uh, presidential debates when he said that he was willing to support uh, a 20 billion uh, program for the Amazon. And uh, that's just amazing. And I think it shows that there is interest and there is, there is commitment. Um, Lori, you and I are publishing uh, very soon, I think in the next couple of days, a, um, a commentary on a, a plan for a hemispheric partnership on energy and climate. And uh, I really think that the opportunity here is great. I mean, the region of course has a lot to gain for, from access to, um, to finance, especially on concessional terms, access to technology. Uh, but the US, I think has even more to gain uh, because it can re-engage with Latin America uh, which is a very important market. I think uh, everyone knows that more than one quarter of U.S. exports go to the region, but also um, it can form a very solid block in terms of uh, commitments to net zero, commitments to the reduction in emissions, um, and it can actually put in motion a number of projects that uh, need finance because what characterizes these projects in the energy transition is that they're long-term, um, they're risky, and, uh, and they need uh, uh, blended and concessional finance. But, uh, but Luis Alberto is the expert on, on, this, uh, on this front. Uh, I'd be very happy to hear what he, uh, what he has to say about this. Oh, uh, based on what Mauricio says, I, I too, uh, in, you know, in that first debate, as you mentioned, that it was very contentious between President Trump and now President Biden, uh, the one thing that came across, the only thing that he talked about really on foreign policy was precisely this notion of, you know, preserving, helping preserve the Amazon, which is part of the global commons that is going to require, you know, this scale of funding. And, and I think if we don't have that transfer of funding, uh, it's going to be very difficult. <clears throat> Getting that awareness and, and especially as, as more and more of the discussion in the United States around infrastructure, this is going to be a central part of it. Uh, if, we're, if we don't get, if, if these signals are not put in place, the commitments on behalf 
of countries in Latin America is going to be very difficult to, for it to take place. And when you look at it, we're at a point <clears throat> where the cost of doing this by comparison are so much lower in terms of the benefits. And this is really the, the big discussion that needs to take takes place. Uh, I know that there will be a summit of the Americas later in the year that will bring all of the heads of state of the Americas uh, towards the end of the year. This is going to be one of the central aspects of the discussion that I think is critical. Today we see you know, a lot of the discussion around immigration and what's happening in the Northern Triangle, but the more structural issue is going to be and the real opportunity in what I consider to be a new type of, of, uh, of coming together in the Americas is precisely around this whole question of energy transition and climate change. Absolutely agree. I mean, I think it's it's certainly an opportunity. I keep coming back to to that question um, that I think we're all asking ourselves is is who pays for it, right? And and what does that mean politically, both in the United States and in in the countries in across the region? Um, I'd like to take in these last nine minutes um, a, an opportunity to switch more directly to some of the questions we have. Um, from the audience, I've been working them in throughout the conversation, but we have a few that I, I'd like to make sure we get to that touch on these topics that we're already discussing. Um, so, so let me switch to them. And, and they're along the same lines of, of what we're discussing. Um, so let me just switch to a few of them here. Um, and one of them is, which fits right in here, which is, um, Minister Jobet, you'll be hosting in two weeks time the Clean Energy Ministerial and the Mission Innovation Meeting. Um, and then later in the year, the Conference of the Parties will occur in Glasgow. What outcome would be important for Latin America beyond Article 6, which you already mentioned? Well, yes, we will be hosting SEM and MI at the end of the month uh, between uh, May 31st and, and, and June 6th. We, we have a great lineup of speakers, by the way. So I. I recommend you all sign up and, and attend the event. So I think for, for Latin America, I don't know if you had a chance to see the, the International Energy Agency's last report. I, if you haven't, for the audience, I think I, I suggest you take a look at it. It's a very comprehensive report on a roadmap to, to net zero by 2050, right? Um, and they basically say that we, we, can, we, can, we can make it as, as a global community, but it's going to be hard. Um, and I think the events that we have, SEM and MI, and the other events before COP26 are kind of building blocks to try to reach those agreements in, in Glasgow. Uh, I think the commitment from the US was very important. I think I was, I mean, in Madrid in, in, in 2019, uh, in the last COP, and, uh, and to have the US on the table, committed as it is, is, is going to be very important. So I think we have a very uh, ambitious agenda for SEM and MI uh, on different topics for, I mean, private and public institutions. But I think that if we are able to cement that ambition and to put behind that ambition a very clear roadmap of what we need to do when and who's going to do what to, to get down, because we have a a lot of rhetoric around climate change, where we need to get down to the details, concrete plans that are measurable, that are, we have accountability. And if we're able to do that between now and Glasgow, and I think some of might be important uh, milestones to that, I think that is, that is where we, what, we, what we need to do. So concrete milestones and targets uh, with, uh, that are basically uh, accountable, that we can check progress on that. I think that is what we need to try, we, we try to, we need to try to agree on. Excellent, thank you. One of the um, topics that a number of our audience members has commented on is political trends in the region. And this question, I would appreciate if um, any one of you or more than one of you would be willing to comment on. How vulnerable is energy policy across the Latin American region to political trends? In Mexico, Brazil, and Venezuela, for example, we see populist politics um, militating against stable energy policies. How big of a problem is this? In fairness, the United States just went through four years of very populist policies itself. 
Mauricio, would you like to begin? Well, thank you. Yes, uh, Laurie, I see, I see challenges and I see opportunity. Uh, the challenges are associated with those platforms, uh, very much the case in Mexico today, of energy nationalism. I think energy nationalism is not a response to anything. It's not going to solve the need of, uh, of, uh, of energy of the countries. It's not going to help in terms of the climate policy agenda. Um, it's certainly a reversal and a very costly one for the people and for the environment. Um, so energy nationalism is, uh, is something I would worry a lot. But then uh, some of these social movements um, are not necessarily talking about energy nationalism. They are talking about uh, energy transition. They are talking about clean air. They're talking about uh, sustainability. So there I see opportunity. I see that uh, um, actually in a region where we have the economic recession resulting from COVID, the loss in terms of jobs, um, climate policies and the energy transition in particular can become part of the solution. They were they are part of the solution to the economic problems. But now I see that this is a topic where the governments, whatever their ideology is, can have a conversation with the groups that are um, uh, expressing unrest. Uh, because it, it's, it's really a topic where you can create trust, where you can uh, speak the same language, where you can say to these groups, yes, we're going to protect the environment, we're going to avoid deforestation, we're going to protect the endangered species, we're to make sure that mining and oil will do under the best practices, et cetera, et cetera. So I think now it's an opportunity uh, for, for governments uh, to, to have this conversation and create confidence, citizens' confidence, which is what's lacking today. Because there's no, there's no, there's no dialogue. I think this, this is, this is, it's, it's very dysfunctional the way uh, the the political system is operating today. And this could be a way of solving that, um, that that issue. Excellent. Thank you. Um, any one last comment? Uh, before yeah, we... Larry, very briefly on that. What, what something we did, uh, we have done twice already, five years ago, and we have just finished it today is that we built our energy policy looking at 2050 through a very broad uh, politic political and process in which NGOs, civil society, members of the academia, I mean, business communities, the government kind of build the policy with a vision for the future, like bottom up. And then that, that, that has worked very well. Uh, it improves the quality of that vision, first, and second, it makes sure, or at least it reduces the, the probability that the next government will start from scratch and change everything, right? So I think uh, transparency in that process has been very important as well. So coming back to what Mauricio was saying, right? In this environment, to build those policies with, with all people on the table, I think it's very, it's, it's essential to be successful. Excellent. Thank you. Luis Alberto? To this, Laura, just, to, just to weave a little bit of, you know, this discussion happened in Chile, as Juan Carlos does well, because in the first government of President Piñera, there was this big discussion around a, a grid in the south of Chile. And, and that, you know, became almost an impossible discussion. And I think to Mauricio's point, at the end of the day, what we really need is Societies want all the good things that we all want. Well, what I think is missing, there's a tremendous gap in terms of how to address the choices and with what timing do you need to address those choices. And I think in as much as that gap of information is there, not only does it provide that Mauricio correctly says, a huge opportunity to build from the bottom up and perhaps is a very different way in which governments have traditionally addressed these issues. But it equally is an opportunity to begin a discussion, to take stock of, of these choices in a much more uh, organized uh, way. And clearly, as uh, equally as Mauricio was saying, as a way to, to build trust, which has been destroyed across uh, 
societies and especially with government. Gentlemen, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. As we mentioned, the full video recording of this event will be available on the Center on Global Energy Policy's website later today. The next session of the seventh annual Columbia Global Energy Policy, the Center on Global Energy Policy's website, uh, pardon me, Summit, Power and Sustainability, the view from India's state-owned utility sector will be held tomorrow, May 20th at 8 a.m. Eastern time. For a full calendar of upcoming events, visit the Center on Global Energy Policy online. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.